Segoli, Nadio Lewis, greetings. What is the news in Oneida? Skana Goga, Skana Go. Are you with peace? I am with peace. I hope you are doing well. I have heard it said again recently. If you want to bring balance to the world, you need to first bring balance with yourself. So first and foremost, thank you very much for being here today. I hope you are taking care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So shout out here, Jason, Stephanie, Kendra, Suzanne, Leslie, Emma, Tiffany, Randall, Sadie, and Morgan, as we are here in week three for fall term two here at Vermont Law School. And it has been such an honor to be able to put our head and our heart spaces together and to be able to learn from one another, whether from legal backgrounds, professional backgrounds, people who have experienced trauma, experienced harm ourselves, and how do we move forward with that. And it's, it's been really powerful having our talking circle on GroupMe, getting to know you all and hearing you all. What do you resonate with most about talking circles or what's, what stands out with you? What stands out to you most about restorative justice and and it has been truly eye-opening to get to learn from each and every one of you. So Yawan Ko, thank you, and Oneida. This has been a really powerful experience here. So I just want to thank you all for that. And even just going over from our this, this last uh, responses for week two, thank you all so much for those who have responded on Canvas to week two. So Randall, as always, your, your way with words is incredible. I'm really impressed with how you approach this uh, subject matter with such a, an academic professionalism and a, a really great job of just having all your citations just <laughs> nailed down. I have, I have a lot to learn from you as well. And I, I appreciate the the kind words for recording. I would just say, just be yourself, Randall. I, I can't wait to hear from you and hear you speak. Morgan, it's amazing that you're in the subarctic and yet able to take part in this class and hearing your responses has been phenomenal. Emma, thank you so much for all your videos you make for the class. It's, it's really great to be able to hear you speak and resonate with different things as well. Jason, phenomenal, phenomenal feedback here that you gave. And I really appreciated your connection to Exterminate All the Brutes on HBO. And people have been telling me about that and telling me about that. But I had just now, because of you, watched the trailer and said, wow, I really need to watch that. That looked really eye-opening and powerful. So thank you so much, Jason. Suzanne, it's incredible to have your perspective here. Thank you so much. Talking about Chief Justice Robert Yazzie, who we'll talk about here again later, and that Haudenosaunee worldview. I really appreciate that holistic worldview that you're, you all are bringing into it as well. And Sadie, really appreciate you as well, too, and your perspective, talking about what is restorative justice, and the quote that stood out to you about, from natural law, we learn to be aware, to observe the effects of certain acts or omissions, to understand the limitations of human existence and to accept that certain things will be whether we like them or not. From McClaskin, page 321, 2005. Powerful. Kendra, it's phenomenal to have you in the class. I really appreciated you with your connection to the drums and seeing this week and how that definitely is that, that medicine, that, that connection that we have, which you're mentioning it now and other people had talked about that connection between your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, and just how important that is with that medicine wheel to have all of those, those pieces of yourself in balance. So very powerful and really appreciated Leslie's picture she sent, she sent back to you, Kendra, about being in nature. And Leslie, your perspective is just so incredible, just your wisdom and your perspective. I really learned a lot from you when you're speaking. So that is phenomenal as we uh, come along here to week three. You all have been phenomenal so far of uh, putting your response in the group me, putting your response on Canvas for the response to for each week as we are now on module three. So we're going to take a deeper dive here with uh, Chief, Chief Justice Robert Yazzie in our videos this week as I'll pull up our syllabus here. But you all got a chance to read a little bit about him and his words here from the last week, this, some of the last readings as well. And really, it's that horizontal shift to justice of being able to talk about all my relations, all my relatives, of acting as if um, a person who acts as if they have no relatives, how harmful that is, right? And this idea that we want to make sure that we are in this horizontal system of justice, as we'll see here. And for the videos, you're going to get a chance after this one you're watching right now. And then the other two as well, too, with 
Robert Yazi about peacemaking and then also Native American spirituality and restorative justice. About an hour long video there, an interview with Chief Justice Robert Yazi, really influential in the restorative justice, I'd say movement, but really as, a, as an archetype and model for other indigenous groups, other people, other allies, just other people who are looking to get involved in restorative justice. So look forward to having you all check that out. And also our, our readings here. So some of the readings include sentencing circles, seeds of a community. You can see the chapter outlined next to each one. United States Supreme Court and in indig indigenous goes on there. And it's talking about really how there's still a long way to go for indigenous peoples to be recognized within our, our current court systems and how the current court systems have a lot to learn about indigenous worldviews as well. Family group conferencing, chapter 35 as well too. And a theme that's been brought out throughout this book, which I really appreciate, and you'll see that in the Navajo Nation peacemaking book as well, is the importance of bringing in relatives to the peacemaking process when there is a harm caused for the person who has, has the support of, of a person next to them, and then also for the person who has caused harm as a reminder that they are so much more than the, than the worst thing that they have done. So having those people for accountability, and then also when the person has family members next to them, perhaps the person who has caused harm, that they are able to have accountability with, with these family members, these relatives next to them, that they take this process more seriously. It's, it's been shown and been talked about in different cases. So that's one example there. Aboriginal legal theory and restorative justice, as we look about this from different areas, different parts of the world too. Implementing alternative structure for dispute and mapping the healing journey, First Nations. And First Nations, they're talking about people in Canada, indigenous people in Canada there. Talking about the New Zealand and Maori a little bit here in these readings. Aboriginal is usually talking about people in Australia. So I appreciate each and every one of you as you are here today. And as we I, I bring out my eagle feather box and enter into a talking circle with you all, again, I think of the words from my, my grandma that whoever is holding this cannot tell a lie. And I also think of the words of one of my colleagues, Dr. Pamela Taylor, who is an elder in the nation of Ken Kenya. She's a professor emeritus from Seattle University, has taught me a great deal about restorative justice and as we're getting into this practice, I think a lot of people approach it differently, and you'll, you'll see that as well. And I remember I was asking Dr. Taylor, I was asking Pamela, how many people do you have to have? What, what is this requirements? And there definitely are, right? There, there definitely are certain things that are done within different communities and protocols, which I, I, I think hold great value. For instance, having an elder opening up and in a prayer and acknowledgement. And I think that having some kind of song or prayer is, uh, is a great way to help shape that atmosphere and environment of understanding, of opening up our headspace and our heart space and connecting that 18 inch journey, which I've been told by Don Coyhis is the longest journey a human being makes in their lifetime. So um, for this idea with Dr. Pamela Taylor, I was saying, so how many people do you need for restorative justice? And she says, uh, TJ, it's my nickname, TJ, just one. I said one, it's so like me and someone else? She said, no, just one, just you. So how do you mean, how would that work? Um, and it talks a little bit about meditation here in our book chapters as well too, but really even that peacemaking we make within. And again, it goes back to that theme I said before, and it's, it's from a children's cartoon show, Avatar, The Last Airbender, but it has a lot of truth, this idea and this meditation and this point in the, the show when it talks about if you want to bring balance to the world, you first must bring balance to yourself. And with that, I want to share screen again here to look at some, some quotes here, what, what, that, what that really means of, of healing and bringing balance. So this first quote from Choctaw wisdom keeper, Sequoia Trueblood reflects on his healing experience. This is a, a, a powerful and, and um, yes, I'll just, I'll just let the words stand for themselves here. Being healed means living in peace, living in acceptance and not judging anyone. Thus, with the residential school experience, healing means to come fully into acceptance of what, of what took place and fully forgiving everyone who is involved. The only way to resolve the pain that comes from living in the past is acceptance and forgiveness. I tried all different kinds of healing, but I did not feel like I was healed until I saw all the things that happened to me as a great gift. And it's, those are some hard words to digest and to read, to be honest. Uh, 
as I think about my great-grandfather, Indian boarding schools, Indian residential schools are what they were called in Canada. The over 130 of those in Canada, Indian residential schools. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's tough to think about the people who sexually abused young children or impregnated young Native American girls and burned their babies alive in crematoriums because they did not see them as human beings or stepped on children's necks and killed them and, and forced their, their, their classmates to step over their bodies and go to class, right? But to forgive those people, right? To not, to not harbor in that anger. Um, this notion I've heard before, if when, you're, when you hold on to anger, it's just like swallowing a pill and hoping that the other person dies, right? Um, but this, this notion how, how, how really, uh, how festering of pain anger can be as well too. So really how, how forgiveness, how, what, what a powerful tool forgiveness is. Not how, and it's to recognize everything that's been done, words and all, harms and all, everything and all, and still choosing to forgive. And I think sometimes forgiveness can come up as weak of saying, uh, sometimes people think like, how could you do that? How could you forgive someone after everything that they've done? But I think when you can truly forget, when you can truly recognize everything that's been done and forgive, I think that's takes one of the strongest hearts and strongest people you can be. So I, I get a lot of wisdom there from Choctaw Wisdom Keeper, Sequoia True Blood. So this is in your upcoming reading as well too for week three, module three. Uh, another one as well, too, there, there's a conversation in one of the book chapters talking about what is a healing journey for an individual. And one of the responses here was a healthy person has something to get up for in the morning. And I know all of us respond and resonate differently with different words, which is why I love using talking circles to, to review the material to see what stands out to different people. But this one in particular, when I was looking over it, it really pulled on my heartstrings there. Uh, here. One of the different developments we want to look at here was in 2010, the Ocho, uh, Ocheti, and I, I apologize for my pronunciation here if I mispronounce this, the Ocheti Sakawin Oyate Truth and Reconciliation Process in South Dakota. And what that is, Lakota scholar Dr. Craig Howe summarizes, says, the hope is that citizens who are well-educated about the Ocheti Sakawan history and culture will be more likely to make better decisions in the arena of Indian issues and to get along better with one another. At a glance, they're looking at land and environment, identity and resiliency, culture and language, a kinship and harmony, oral tradition and story, sovereignty and treaties, a way of life and development. So how powerful that truth and reconciliation is through educating. We talk about these phrases here in class of acknowledge, educate, and honor, and how powerful those tools are as well too. And really this preventative medicine, if you will, of being able to educate people and tell you and be able to be an active agent of history and telling your own story, how powerful that is to, for people to tell their own stories, which is a noted idea for decolonization and also a noted idea in restorative justice and talking circles, being able to tell your own story. Um, as we flip gears a little bit here, part of your requirement for class each week is to spend 10 minutes at least in nature or if you're not able to spend it in nature on mother earth, uh, on grass or with some other plant or tree, I encourage you with water, which is one of our first medicines we have as human beings that we ourselves are comprised of 60% of it at least and our earth is comprised of at least 70% of it. I wanna read the words here of Rene Sansoki, educator and activist. And I apologize if I mispronounced the last name there. Rene says, when you're approaching water, you make that petition to water, and you make that tobacco offering because water is older than we are. That's our elder. So we talk about those different medicines for different things. And I have on me here, this uh, tobacco bundle of Oneida grown tobacco from Oneida, Wisconsin, which my grandma made and bundled for me. And with this bundle, I've been taught we have for three things that you usually do with this, that you would give thanks to the creator, that you would make a request to the creator, and that you would ask for guidance to the, to the creator. So in this situation, you'd be giving thanks to the creator for mother earth, for the, for which, what we reside upon, this living being that we are all a part of her. If you're on Turtle Island, which is uh, to my under, understanding, North America. Um, and I believe I've heard some people describe it as South America in, included in that as well too, or I've heard there's just specific names for South America as well. Um, but that's just one of those ideas. And we're, we're, we're paying the land, the theme of this semester as well, too, to pay the land as if you're, you are engaging with a friend in, in a, um, 
and a familiar relationship with a relative. And each time you're visiting it, you're becoming more and more familiar as you meditate with the land there. I also have my own nighted grown sage right here, and that is to ward off negativity. So some of the medicines I like to use. So if we were in this talking circle right now, if I was I would put this in the middle, which would be our, our virtual centerpiece. So I hear as our Oneida grown tobacco and in our Oneida grown sage for to give thanks to the creator uh, and also to ward off some negativity here. And one of the reasons why I want us to engage with nature so much is it reminded me of a conversation I had with one of my colleagues and mentors who is an ally, a non-Indigenous person, but a great person, also a faculty member at Vermont Law School. His name is Dr. Sean Horrigan. I remember I was visiting University of San Diego to see which schools I wanted to pursue my PhD at, which I recently finished my PhD this last April at University of San Diego in leadership studies. And I remember when I was there, I was very drawn to Dr. Sean Horrigan, this conversation of what's called um, AQUAL, which is it stands for these all quadrants, all lines, uh, et cetera, many things as well too after that. But basically the, the concept here, it's, it's by Ken Wilber and it's how do you make change on a systemic level and how do you make change on a grand level? How do you make change with, with the major populations? Around the time, this is in 2016, 2017, and this is during the time of the Dakota Access Pipeline, if you're familiar with that, with the, where they're trying to stop DAPL from the Army Corps of Engineers who would use the Dakota Access Pipeline to uh, go through different traditional lands of the Dakota people, the Standing Rock people, and who are uh, in English known as the Ogala Sioux, comprised of the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people. For the Standing Rock people, um, they were here trying to say that water is life. Mini Wachoni, water is life. You can't drink oil. And as my grandmother and elder in the Oneida Nation said, and many other elders I'd heard say, even before the spills happen, I said, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when the oil spills happen. And when they do happen, that then makes the land un unusable for growing, for uh, any kind of agriculture, and then also for drinking the water. You can't drink the, oil, the water anymore if there's any kind of spills or contaminations. So Dr. Sean Horgan was telling me this idea of how do we, how do we change people's perspective? I had gone there for a day to the protests um, in Standing Rock and other people had been there for seven or eight months and different things, a, a long time, giving, dedicating their life to this cause. And I say, how do you really create change? So as we have water, our first medicine here, and he was telling me, he said, well, TJ, Thomas, if you, if you, wanna, you wanna create change, he says, you have, to, you have to think about how people think about things on an individual level. And so in this, he, he's, he sketched out for me these four quadrants. So I is, is this first quadrant, the first quadrant. And it's a subjective. This is people's thoughts, emotions, memories, states of minds, perceptions, and immediate sensations. So this is what, how people think about water. What, what, it, what it, In this example, we're using water, but you could use this for a number of issues, right? So how, what, how, what is your relationship with this? It is the material body uh, and anything that you can see or touch in time and space, objective, I'm told this is our actions of, of how we interact, of how we speak, of, of uh, for in, this instance of how we actually use water on an individual level. The interobjective or the its, which is the third quadrant down there in the bottom right. This is the systems, network, technology, government, and the natural environment. So I've been told this is the laws, the structure. What are the laws and systems we have around water rights and around water? And then you look at the intersubjective, the we, which is the fourth quadrant. And this is the what are our shared values, meanings, language, relationship, and cultural background? What is our culture relative to water in our society? How, how, do, how do we as a people treat that and speak about that and talk about that informally in our culture, in our society? So I think if you want to make a change on, an, on a grand level, on the cultural level, you need to first go back to that first quadrant of changing how people interact and think about, and think about an issue. And I remember that for me was the foot in the door of, wow, this is an incredible what an incredible person and ally to tell me about this. And then also what an incredible tool this is to be able to create change. If, if you can you change the way that someone thinks about something on a personal level, this in turn can be this domino effect to change how we as a culture interact with things. So in this case, water, our medicine, how water is life. Another resource I put here in our announcements on Canvas, but this one in particular is a really exciting resource for you all as professionals, as legal professionals and advocates and allies, and also um, as people who want to do good for indigenous peoples and indigenous communities. This here is a, um, a website, digitreaties.org. 
And this is, it's 374 ratified Indian treaties visible for the first time because of an anonymous donation. So on here, you can search specific tribes and you can see on here, you'll be, as you can see in the bottom right, they're uploaded in their original cursive. They're oftentimes on tattered pieces of paper. So they're hard to read, but these are still, to my understanding, these, every single one of these federally ratified treaties has been broken by the federal government. So if you were to look these up, if you were to look up a certain treaty, if you were on a certain land base, or if you are curious about a certain people, or if you want to help a certain people, or if you have heritage towards a certain people, you could search on this website to see what those treaties are and to see what the obligations are which have been broken and how this could be recognized still to this day. How according to the constitution, uh, treaties are the supreme law of the land. And this is, goes back to the Indian Commerce Clause in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 of the Constitution that recognize that the federal government will interact with, with tribal nations the same way as they do with international entities and state governments. And as we go on here into Native American Heritage Month, so hope, happy Native American Heritage Month as we recognize peoples from North and South America. And as we talk about indigenous um, communities, we're talking about communities in Africa, and we're also talking about communities here in Turtle Island, North and South America. Um, so some songs here I recommend. Last week I gave you all some, some comic books, some graphic novels. So Yawan Wanko, thank you all for the respect and for getting the kick out of that. So some, some songs that, and some artists that recon recommend here. Fawn Wood, really powerful singer, always brings out the spiritual side of me. Bear Fox, the song Rich Girl, I believe had won a number of awards and the lyrics there are very powerful. Fist in the Air by Lil Mike and Funny Bone. There are some phenomenal advocates who use rapping and use hip hop to be able to tell some political messages and do it in a great way. Indomitable by DJ Shub. Uh, he's a more of a, a Native American using dance music, electronic music, and fusing it with, with traditional music, such as the Northern Cree Singers, a famous traditional singing group. Red Bone, famous Native American band. And if you have seen the Hulu show called Reservation Dogs, there's a part where they, there's an episode that talk all about Redbone and it's uh, pretty good. So come and get your love. You ever heard of come and get your love? So Redbone, Native American band. So they're one of the, one of the first, I believe, to, to break the top, uh, to break into the top uh, 100 billboard hits. So a lot to be said about Redbone and definitely their graphic novel. I, I recommended last week for you all to check out. Definitely should check that out. Black Lodge singers have a number of great songs as well, too. And this Kids Pow Wow songs are really good as well, I like. And um, those are just some. So, uh, Yawanko, thank you so much in Oneida. I hope you all keep taking care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Again, that, that message, that mantra, if you want to, want to bring balance to the world, you first must bring balance to yourself. So, Skenagoga, Skenago, are you with peace? I am with peace. So y'all want code. Thank you so much, class. In the words of DJ Felly Fell, fate nobody loves you. Dr. Reed loves you. I appreciate you. Gunalunkwa means I love you in Oneida. And Nugiwa, until next time. Thanks, class. Take care.